So I call the Thomas Jefferson Planning District Commission to order for a Thursday, April 4th, 2024, 7 p.m. meeting. Welcome, everyone. Uh, commissioners, we do need to, there will be a change in the agenda this evening. We will be required, or well, we need to go, we're not required, we, are, we need to go into closed session for a consultation. I'm going to place that at the following the executive director's report. And if time permits, then we can come back out and do the round table. But if time does not permit, then the round table is going to kind of hunting on the agenda. If there's no objection to that, fit in the closed session. Great, thank you. So we will start with the call, uh, the roll call. Ruth? Supervisor Galloway? Present. Supervisor Pruitt? Supervisor O'Brien? Mr. Smith? Supervisor Goolsby? Present. Mr. Higgins? Present. Supervisor Barlow. Supervisor Woodward. Present. Supervisor Reed. Here. Supervisor Rutherford. Here. Commissioner Durancio. Here. Councillor Payne. Great. And Mr. Smith, Mr. Barlow, and Mr. Payne all told us in advance that uh, there's some uh, reasons, pertinent reasons, to not be here tonight. Mr. Payne's a meeting with City Council. Barlow's got some continuing ed related to his board going on. Mr. Smith is out of town. Uh, Mr. Pruitt from Albemarle will be joining us late. He had a uh, function related to UVA and the program he's in, so he's going to arrive a little bit later. Um, and then Mr. O'Brien, I expect we'll probably see. Um, <clears throat> nobody's online. We need to have participated. We don't need to do that. And we'll go to matters from the public. Uh, anyone in the room wish to give public comment? Anyone online wish to give public comment? We used to do public comment on the what's this down? <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll check that on. We'll move to, so we're closing public comment. We'll go to right into our presentations this evening. And Ms. Pennington has our first one the Ride Share Cap Strategic Plan Updates. Hello. Great. Sorry. 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 Watching the news over there? How did you know how to do that? <laughs> <laughs> it was an air reader or a drink log? Yeah. It's like a, I had the one on there. It's like, go ahead and take the notes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hello, everyone. It's nice to see you again. Um, as I promised from our presentation about the Rideshare Annual Operating Grant in February, I have come back to you with updates of our CAP strategic plan. CAP stands for Commuter Assistance Program. So Rideshare began in the 80s, and then in 2009, it expanded to include the Central Shenandoah Planning District Commission, as we saw a large number of the commuters traveling from that region into the TJPDC for um, employment. So as we're going through this strategic plan, one of the things that we're doing is working in tandem and developing all of this with our partners at CSPDC. Since most of the program is operated together and marketed, um, TJPDC does a lot of the administrative tasks of it, but we really partner together to make sure that we're getting the message about um, rideshare and the commuter assistance programs far and wide. Um, the purpose of this plan is really much like how the transit providers have to do a strategic plan um, to meet requirements for DRPT, same for the CAPS programs. Um, this really gives us an opportunity to look at the program, to see how it's working, to see what's changed. Um, it does replace a previous five-year plan that we did before called the TDMP or the Transportation Demand Management Plan, but that's a mouthful, so TDMP was shorter. Um, and it really sets the tone and helps guide us for the next several years of the program. So there are a few components of the program. One of it, like I said, is assessment and changing the travel demand. Um, you know, we saw a lot of changes come out of the pandemic. Um, a lot of people, their lifestyles, their work styles have changed. A little bit more remote work in some areas, some areas not. So this, in some ways, is a really good time to be looking at and evaluating 
how this program um, functions in this area and what needs our communities have. Again, there'll be some evaluation. Um, the planning will move forward to look at the structure of the program and then make sure that we are aligning up with future funding requests um, that we do for DRPT each year. Um, as I said, this plan directly informs and affects the applications that we submit every February. Um, what we put in this plan will be looked at every time our grant application um, is evaluated and considered. Uh, the plan does not completely guarantee that the program will always be funded just because the strategic plan has been approved, but it certainly sets us up for success in that particular arena. All right, so some of the benefits, again, making sure that we understand what is happening in our own region and our own communities, building that foundation for moving the program forward, um, looking at effectiveness and efficiency of the programs and services, and then looking at you know, the changing landscape that we see here in this region and in the state as a whole. So here are the various chapters that are in the CAP strategic plan that DRPT, the guidance that they have put forth for us. We'll kind of go through um, each of them. The reasons that four and five are highlighted in red is because that is where we currently are. Um, so that's the steps um, that we are finishing up. So we're about halfway through, which is really exciting. We are working with a local consultant, Launch Consulting, to assist us through this plan. Um, so chapter one, is just a brief overview. Not all uh, commuter assistance plans throughout the state are set up or designed exactly the same while we serve a very similar purpose. Some of them are housed in transit agencies. Some of them are housed in PDCs like ours in Central Shenandoah. Some operate in other um, entities or indep independents. So chapter two, this is where it starts to get really interesting, is looking at the demographics and the characteristics of the citizens and residents in this region. So we're looking at not only who lives here and who is commuting here, but what travel patterns, what services they have available to them currently, and what existing facilities like park and ride lots, things like that. Um, we're gathering a lot of this data from a variety of sources. That has been one of the challenging parts of doing this coming out of the pandemic, is making sure that we are finding both consistent, comprehensive, and reliable data. So we are pulling from a few different places. These are some of examples of some of the data that we've um, already collected. So we're looking at population, how much of that population is workforce age, um, so forth. Also looking at employer data. Who are the employers in this region that folks are commuting to? What type of industry is that? Where are they located? This, um, still working through this map, you gotta remove some of these labels so you can see it, but I think this is a good illustration to show that you know where the residents are living, where they're commuting to. I will say none of this was a huge surprise, which is good. Sometimes it's nice to know that you are on the right track and um, having that data to be able to um, confirm that is really great. We are still in the process of gathering some data. We are currently conducting a survey that is open through April 12th so we can get some qualitative as well as some quantitative data to help um, complete the story. So our Mission and vision, which is one of the things that we established in chapter three, so about a month ago, is to con is connecting people to inclusive and sustainable transportation alternatives in order to increase mobility and enhance quality of life. Um, I think we all know sometimes what it feels like to have or to set into traffic for long periods of time and how that can kind of impact your life, your mood, all of that. So we want to take it as a very holistic approach. Um, transportation is more than just getting from point A to point B. Um, it, it covers a lot of different areas and aspects of people's lives. Um, I think I said back in February, just kind of an overview of TDM or transportation demand management is a use of strategies to help inform and encourage trip excuse me, travelers to maximize the efficiency of the transportation systems 
leading to improved mobility, reduced congestion, lower vehicle admissions. So again, we wanted to take that into consideration as we were going through and developing what our mission and our vision would be. Um, in addition to that, we came up with uh, four main goals and then additionally objectives to go with those as to what we would like to see and accomplish in the next four years. Obviously, the main component of all state-operated CAPS programs is to reduce single occupancy vehicle trips. So that had to pretty much be goal one. That is the overarching goal of everything that we try to do with this program. Um, next is we want to make goal one happen by encouraging more utilization of trip planning tools. So we have not only the app through Connecting VA, as well as there is a tool that can kind of help you plan how to get to whatever trip you want to go through. And now the really exciting thing about that tool is it is actually statewide comprehensive. So if you go on to, to our site and go to use that tool, it doesn't just tell you how to get around our region, but it does help people figure out even bigger and longer distance trips um, to anywhere in the state, which I think is a huge improvement um, for helping everyone understand what options they have. Um, next, we want to build and maintain relationship with, with community stakeholders to promote regional collaboration around transportation solutions. That's a little bit of a mouthful, but essentially what we mean is we know that there's not a one solution to transportation problems or issues. Um, if there was, wow, life would be incredible. Um, but we recognize that oftentimes we need to work in tandem and together to make sure that there are options in place, um, regardless of what the situation is. You know, transit doesn't necessarily work for every person or every community. So what can we do in between there? How can we fill in gaps? And oftentimes tedium ends up being some of those places where we can fill in those gaps. Um, and then lastly, educate community members on TDM as a solution to increased mobility and access through the service area. You know, one of the things that TDM has the ability to do is to really increase access to jobs, to health care. Um, it also improves the climate, potentially um, citizens' health as well, if they bike and walk and can do that, even if it's just a first mile, last mile. There's just so many different ways that it can work in a region and in a community um, to help see improvements. So where we are right now is in our target market and customer phase. So we have been working with the consultants. We did a fun little exercise um, to look at developing customer personas or profiles. So what are the type of people that could potentially take advantage of this program. We came up with three target markets, and that is commuters from the CSPDC region. We know that there is a considerable amount of folks that are traveling across the mountain. We have a whole bus service for it now. So the people are definitely there. Historically, at least in my time at Rideshare, which has been over 10 years, that is definitely where we have seen a majority of people um, commute from. Now, granted, while they don't live here, they certainly take up the space on our streets and in our parking lots um, and all of that. So there is a lot to be said for helping and assisting those folks. It also brings a greater level of access um, for employees for the jobs that we have. The next market is, of course, commuters within the TJPDC region. So folks who are commuting either from the rural counties or um, even folks commuting very locally. I think sometimes the misnomer of a commute is that it has to be a long distance. But any time that you are leaving your place of residence and traveling, whether that's by foot, by bike, by transit, by car, anything, is a level of commute. And so it is important to remember that we serve all of those levels of commutes because there are different options for those different levels. And then the last market that we um, determined was commuters from outside of the region of the TJPDC, obviously beyond CSPDC. We see quite a few van pools go to UVA from Richmond. Um, there are folks that commute sometimes from Lynchburg. And we're kind of starting to see, to some degree, 
some of those markets increase. Um, so we want to make sure that we pay attention and that we figure out how we can help them meet their needs and get the information that they need about commuting. So some of the things that we're doing, like I said, we're developing those uh, personas or profiles. We're looking at what are the motivators or benefits to potentially taking alternative transportation? What are the barriers? That is always an important thing to look at. And sometimes those are a little more glaringly obvious than, than sometimes the benefits. So we really have to do a good job of making sure we're communicating those benefits and looking at what those barriers are. And then what can be done to shift behavior? That is the ultimate question and quest kind of of these commuter assistance programs is we are asking people to do something different than what they normally do or, or sometimes first inclined to do. And asking for behavior change can sometimes be a decent ask. So understanding what can move that needle for someone or what we can do to help them make that choice I think is a really important factor that I'm intrigued to see what will come out of this. So the upcoming chapters, we have our operational plan, which we have begun. Um, that's basically how we implement it, how we run it from day to day, how we operate it through the entire fiscal year. Next, once we kind of have an idea as to what we want to do or what we'd like to do, we're going to look at the financial plan and how does that fit in with the parameters that we have? How can we try to achieve these goals and objectives? Um, I'm also really excited about the monitoring and the evaluation plan. I think that'll be really interesting to see what tools we can put in place to make sure that we are meeting the needs and communicating effectively. A lot of what we do at Rideshare is getting the word out of letting people know what their options are. Because if they don't know what the options are, they can't make those choices. Um, so I think that'll be really interesting to see how we can continually check in with ourselves, see how we're doing there. And then um, chapter eight is just kind of um, a com compilation of all of the research and the data that was conducted to um, complete the plan. So next steps, like I said, we are finalizing those target markets and the customers and the operation plan. We'll work through the finances and the monitoring and the evaluation. And we do hope to have a finished product by launch uh, by July 12th. They actually put in that date themselves. So just into the new fiscal year, it will be coming back to this board um, as a draft and then for adoption. Um, because this is our governing board as being a PDC program. So you will see me again <laughs> and hear maybe some of this again, and then maybe in some different details. So just wanted to kind of set the stage for that to let you know what we've been doing and what you can be looking forward to. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes. Um, I can get there. Just give me one second. Anyway, um, this is an, an issue that, that uh, we brought up to the in the regional transit governance study of mm -hmm. the John Rural Transit Needs Assessment, which is Nelson County. Yes. Um, we are the southernmost part of the planning district, and many of the people who live in the south part and in the west part of the county um, primarily are going elsewhere not within the district for their daily community mm -hmm. so we're not just commuters from outside the region coming in we're having commuters from the region going out true yes so um i, I brought this up at the john uh meeting that we had last week i guess and um, there, there really wasn't an answer to how we can get the data about how many of the people in Nelson County actually have transit needs, mm -hmm. commuter transit needs outside of the district. Yeah. So um, for us, trying to uh, utilize the data that comes out of these um, looks like it's not going to be very exemplary of our county. Sure, maybe not painting the whole picture. Right. Yeah. Maybe the conclusions come out. So um, I'm just, you know, I'm, I, 
I'm trying to flag that sure. so that it gets paid attention to because when we decide where our, you know, how we're going to deal with our transit needs, um, you know, it may or may not be advantageous for us to be, you know, only focusing. I mean, it certainly is to just focus on this area, but we don't really have an opportunity to focus on sure. the south part because of the way that this, these are structured and also because the consultants thus far haven't had any knowledge that that's an issue. Yeah, no, that's that's a great point. And there are other CAPS programs throughout the entire state. Um, there's one in Lynchburg, which I, which covers more than just Lynchburg. So that may start to kind of butt up with us. And so we may be able to talk to some of the folks there um, to see if, you know, if they have some of this data or if they have a picture of it. We may be able to to communicate with some of the other programs. That would be really important. Yeah. If you're going to depend on, on the chalk study to, to determine transit needs, they're only contacting people that you don't have in person. That yeah. doesn't really go to us. Yeah, I totally understand what you're saying. And it is an interesting um, position because we are, you know, somewhat bound to our regional boundaries, but we know at the same time that those boundaries don't necessarily mean anything to the everyday citizen. They drive or go where they need to go, which is why bodies like this are so important to think regionally, but then we've got to think even a little bit outside of our region. So I don't know how many commuters yeah. fellow, for instance, or right. Tree Falls. Yeah. But people there when they have transit needs normally they're going to Lane's Pearl and Stanley. Yeah. Sure yeah. Piece of the Yes, exactly. And so we we may be able to capture a little bit with that part since we're working so closely with CSPDC. And I will definitely keep that in mind and maybe reach out to some of our other folks. Um, not everyone is doing the strategic plan all at the same time. They kind of have a staggered, um, probably for some funding reasons, and so that the consultants um, in the area don't get overwhelmed doing, you know, 20 of these. Um, but I will definitely reach out to some other folks. I'll see who else is doing their strategic plans or when they're occurring. And we just want whatever, sure. whatever needs assessments are being done. And yeah. Some counties, so. yeah. That, I think that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. Louisa County has the same thing. Sure. With Eastern part of the county, the majority of those people go in Richmond or mm -hmm. down around Lake Ann, a lot of those folks go in Fredericksburg. Mm -hmm. So you're exactly right. It's yeah. Not just people that are commuting in the shore. Yeah. And that was one of the reasons why we thought it was very important to look just beyond the two regions where we know things are happening, but we know things are happening out there. It it might be on a slightly smaller scale, but that doesn't mean that it won't grow over time or it might shrink. We don't know. That's that's why we've got to look at it. But those are excellent points for sure. The steam route was it in the NPO meeting? There was data being some meeting that I've been in the last few weeks was showing data of people living here who were commuting to Fairfax and places like that. I thought that was in a presentation yeah. in the NPO. That was in that sense the regional housing partnership update on the sense plan on oh, the economic development strategy. So that data is out there. Yes. It just may not be in this place, but yes. we were looking at data of folks that were commuting as far away as Northern Virginia and Northern Basis, Richmond, out of the area. And so if they're using it, I'd be curious what the sourcing was mm -hmm. of that data, because my guess is if it exists for wherever they parsed it out for, it does exist for you. Um, it's just a matter of figuring out what that source is. Do it's the, the census on the map tool. They have an interactive tool where you can manipulate all of the different variables and you can look at commuting patterns coming into an area and going out of. And you can do all the way down to census track and, and as large as region. You can do county-wide so you can really begin to break down some of that data. What it's not necessarily doing, though, is, is looking at propensity for travel using a different mode. You know, like that's literally how many people are working in one place and living in another. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things that the MPO is looking at doing is really looking at travel demand management strategies and getting even more granular with the data by using street light data to see exactly where people are coming from and exactly where they're going so that we can start to really think about where are these 
employment centers, activity centers, where are the places that people are coming to within urban er urbanized areas from external rural areas so that you can start thinking about managing the travel demand, mm -hmm. whether that's park and ride lots, whether that's parking garages and people take public transit, you know, all of these different increasing choice or modes of travel. And that's a good point as well, Christine, in saying that, you know, we have these different sources of data and sometimes they do a little bit of different things, but sometimes they don't quite get us quite to what we're looking for. You know, not knowing why someone is making a trip on surface level seems maybe inconsequential, but it's not necessarily because what if they were only making that trip once or twice? and not on a regular basis, you know what I mean? So sometimes getting to those real granular levels can be really hard. And like I said, we have had a little bit of struggle, the consultants, with making sure that we're getting those comprehensive, reliable data sources. And, you know, we all know that the last census was not everything we wanted it to be. And so we have, they have been working to really kind of piece together to paint the clearest picture that we can come up with with the numbers. But I think that's also why the qualitative data is so important because the numbers can only tell a part of the story, but getting to hear from people who are commuting to other places and why that is, I think is really invaluable as well. We could share that out, or are we planning to do a set of data here? We are just for partnership, so it's coming. It, uh, yes, it, it's um, linked in the executive director's report. But the draft came to us very late, so we want to make sure to get in front of you guys as soon as we have the draft. But it'll come before you in your May meeting for a comprehensive presentation, and you guys will actually be taking action on um, accepting that report. I mean, I'm not saying yeah that it's going to show you the transit needs, but I don't think it was also. I think it parsed out people going one one off trips. I think this mm -hmm. was moving for employment. Is Enrico stood out as a destination for employment? Then mm -hmm. there were more going to Fairfax than I would ever have expected out of the area too. Um, that's just yeah. my memory of that. For what that's worth. Other questions. Christine, I'm going to go there. You alluded to the use of metrics from street lights. How exactly does that work? There, there, there is street light data. Our staff has not used it. We now have access to that data through the Virginia Department of Transportation that we have never utilized before. And so part of the work of the MPO is to have staff going through the training to learn what is this street light data tool? What types of data does it have? What, how is it useful in our work? But we don't know as much about it as, as we would like to. That's why we want to do this. You're talking about street lights, AKA the poles with lamps on top of them? Yep, cameras. Intersection lights. Yep. Cameras associated with that infrastructure. Hmm. Ah, why don't we just say surveillance? It's, it's what the tool is called. Yeah. Now I understand. Thank you. Other questions? Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And like I said, you will hear from me again. Don't worry. <laughs> the next item uh, B in the presentation to go to fiscal year 25. Uh, this the uh, Charles Admiral Metropolitan Planning Organization Unified Planning Work Approach. So it'll be um, a fairly quick item. The Planning District Commission doesn't need to take action on this item. This is action that's actually taken by the policy board. Um, but I did want to keep updating you guys on the work. So the MPO, um, it's called a UPWP, the Unified Planning and Work Program. It identifies all the transportation planning related activities that will be occurring within the metropolitan area. Um, federal law requires that the MPO address eight basic planning factors, which are listed here. The funding that we receive for the MPO comes from two different federal agencies, both FHWA, which is Federal Highways Planning Funds, which is administered through VDOT, and by which we receive a local match, but also through um, Federal Transit Association, and that's administered through DRPT, who provides the um, state match for that. So we received 80% of the funds through federal sources, 10% from state through VDOT and DRPT, and 10% from local. Please stop me if I'm using too many acronyms. That happens a lot in the transportation <laughs> planning world. So if you want me to say that out loud, please stop me. 
Um, additionally, VDOT receives their own state planning and research funds. Uh, those do not come through the TJPDC's books, but they are related to planning activities within this region. I believe last year that amount was approximately 170,000. That's what you'll see in the draft budget, but I just learned today that that's been increased by a little bit. So there'll be uh, some changes that I make before bringing it back to the policy board. So the funding for the work program, I know that's really tiny, but it was included in your packet, um, is broken out by both funding source, both the federal and the state sources and local, but then it also shows the state planning research funds in the yellow line so that the total amount of funding is down at the very bottom in the, in the dark salmon pink line. Um, and that's the amount of planning funds that are dedicated to the metropolitan areas of, of our region for work transportation. Anybody wants to you know, dig into any details, please ask, but this is intended to be a high level pass since the policy board digs into all the details. Okay, next one. And then the next table is just parsing out that financial information slightly different rather than by funding source, it is by activities. So uh, the planning work for the MPO is split up into three different tasks. One of them is the administration of the, of the MPO. The other two, one of them is long range planning and the other one is short range planning. So this splits it up by the tasks that will be uh, proposed for FY25 work program and then also by the two uh, funding sources. The next steps for the UPWP, it has already gone before the policy board in their February meeting to give us direction on the types of activities that they would like to see in the next work plan. It then was presented to both, to all MPO tech, the Citizens Advisory Committee and the policy board in their March meetings in its full draft format with details on all the work plan. And then it comes back to the policy board in their April meeting for consideration for approval. The final draft of the UPWP then gets sent both to FHWA and FTA for them to review to make sure they don't have any um, outstanding issues or revisions, um, and then is uh, able to be delivered in its final format for us to be able to receive our funding. Any questions on the policy words? Unified planning work. Great, thank you. All right, the next item is the Blue Ridge Cigarette Tax Board. I believe David is going to walk us through them. Yes, um, this um, Blue Ridge Cigarette Tax Program, Cigarette Tax Board, you want to call it a program, I think is a prime example of a service that Planning District Commission uh, is implementing the request of member localities. And in the case of the, the BRCTB, it included localities. Not only in this region, but outside of the region. We could go to the first time. Please, thank you. Um, but really, following the, the approval by the General Assembly in 2020, that gave uh, counties the authority to have some additional taxing revenue generating authority, one of which was cigarette taxation. Um, several of the jurisdictions in the region and, and outside um, came to TJPD and said, hey, this looks like this is a you know, good way to do something on a regional basis. So uh, we have a good working group of folks who, um, you know, had a actually good model um, from Northern Virginia, which had been, um, had a regional cigarette tax board for almost 50 years, I think, at the time. Uh, but we came together and uh, culminated, I guess, in October of 2021 uh, with the establishment of the Blue Ridge Cigarette Tax Board. Uh, which is uh, consists of eight jurisdictions, four of which are in the TJPDC and four outside. Um, you can see there are six counties, the city of Charlottesville and the town of Madison. Um, they all agreed to join this regional board, have representation on the regional board, uh, and then each adopted a local ordinance to tax cigarettes beginning January of 2022. So the TJPDC serves as the administrator to the board, um, we, um, you know, I'm, I'm saying there, we, we work with them on a monthly basis. We work on every day with them, especially, you know, Laura, who's here with us, and Gretchen, our administrative assistant, who, who does the heavy lift on this. But we work directly with the distributors who are um, submitting reports of the cigarettes that they have delivered to retailers who are selling cigarettes uh, across these jurisdictions. They're collecting the tax for that jurisdiction from those retailers for each pack of cigarettes, and then they're remitting that back uh, on a monthly basis to TJPDC. 
Uh, we're you know going through the process of tracking all the tax that are sold, the revenue uh, that's generated, processing all of that, uh, and then we're remitting uh, the money back out to the localities uh, minus our administrative expenses and minus a two percent discount that the distributors get uh, for uh, the work that they do in administering uh, the cigarette tax. Next slide, please. A uh, snapshot of just to give you a sense of uh, revenues and tax of cigarettes that are sold um, across the footprint of the Human Cigarette Tax Board. Uh, just uh, January, I think we finished our February numbers now. But when this was put together, we had January, you can see about $213,000 was allocated out to those eight jurisdictions. Um, that was, uh, I'm sorry, that is, um, those are cigarette. Those, that's revenue, sorry. That's revenue. And then July through December, um, you can see that the total was about 1.4 million. And that was all on a total number of packs sold for the first seven months of the current fiscal year of over 5 billion in this footprint. A lot of people are smoking. Um, and then our administrative cost uh, for that same period, uh, just over $90,000. In the past two plus years, we have seen overall um, the number of packs sold uh, is slightly decreasing, which I think you know for the folks uh, that are on the board would tell you that's that's the number one goal is we want to see a reduction in smoking. Uh, and so of course, finally, you know the amount of revenue uh, that is coming in and being allocated back out to the jurisdictions uh, is declining as well. And our expenses have been uh, pretty steady. Um, you know, fluctuating a little, little bit, but uh, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of eleven or twelve or thirteen thousand dollars. And then our expenses then are are spread and allocated out. Um, to the member jurisdictions on a monthly basis based on how many packs of cigarettes are actually reported to us as being sold in the jurisdiction. So, um, here's just a little bit uh, a, a deeper dive to show you, uh, you know, the trend lines uh, over the past six months. The packs sold, again, July to January. Um, you can see, um, I guess, the first bar is, uh, is the previous years, January or July to January numbers, and then the second bar in each month is the current fiscal year uh, calculation. Um, I will I will note, um, I'll actually just go to the next slide. slide. Something I wanted to note, which one actually. Um, this is a breakdown of the number of packs sold across the different jurisdictions in the reason, just in a pie chart form. Uh, you will see, if you can, if you can see, uh, it's kind of small, but the jurisdictions are listed uh, over on the right, and then if you start at 12 o'clock, they're, they're in the order um, around uh, around the circle. Uh, so you can see Albemarle and Augusta, uh, well over half of the total package among the eight jurisdictions uh, across the region. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here again is that kind of that seven-month representation um, uh, of, of how the revenues uh, uh, are being allocated. You'll see the bump up there uh, in July and August of 23. Orange County increased its cigarette tax, effective July 1 of 23, uh, from I believe it was 15 cents, 12 cents, I'm sorry, up to 40 cents, which is the maximum for counties. So that's what we think is probably responsible for that bump. But then again, as I mentioned earlier, you're really seeing that, that slight decline on a month to month basis continue. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and then again, here's a, a, a pie chart representation uh, of the allocation by jurisdiction uh, of the cigarette tax revenues. Uh, you're going to Alamarle again, 40 cent tax rate for cap, most cigarettes that are sold. Uh, so they've got the highest chunk uh, in the funds. You'll notice that Augusta, not quite as big. Uh, as they were in terms of the number of packs sold, that's because their tax rate is at 15 cents per pack. Uh, and so they uh, are at the same tax rate as both the city of Stanton and the city of Waynesboro and Augusta County. They have a cigarette tax that's 15 cents per pack as well. Uh, and then on around Orange County, uh, you see it comes in pretty large as well. Um, you probably partly account for that tax increase that they had last July 1st. And we're glad to anybody you know, provide the you know specific jurisdiction information to you. Uh, just a couple of things about the work of the board, uh, and then most recently, um, uh, Eric Dahl's county administrator of Louisiana County is the current chair. Was elected last fall. 
Uh, the next meeting of the board is in uh, a couple of weeks. The board meets quarterly. Uh, the will be meeting on April 22nd. Uh, the board is required to uh, adopt a budget and make a recommendation to the TJPDC for the inclusion of that budget number in the TJPDC's budget. So at the April meeting, it will consider uh, fiscal year 25 budget of $2.9 million, which is the number you will see uh, in the budget that Christine will present to you shortly. A couple of things that we've tried to do uh, just in working with the board uh, you know, as the administrator, uh, making sure that there's uh, you know, information that they want to see uh, on a monthly basis. We uh, you know, are, are doing that uh, under the, the realm of that third bill of fair and financial management. Um, we've started uh, returning interest and uh, any distributor fees and any erroneous payments back to the jurisdictions on a monthly basis. We have not been doing that monthly, but just periodically before. Um, distributor fees are um, every year at the uh, beginning of the calendar year. Um, we ask for distributors to re-register uh, with us. There's a re-registration fee of $50. Um, that is really just for them to get back on the record with us. We, we turn the biggest portion of that back around to the, to the localities. Uh, board members are also receiving on a monthly basis um, the bank statements for both the operational and the reserve fund. Uh, they're seeing the reconciliations for those. And uh, again, trying to work with our distributors uh, on some of the financial uh, mechanics of, um, of the cigarette tax program is we have just this month um, uh, made available to them a bank account by which they can pay us by, uh, by the direct deposit ACH. They had been mailing checks to us, and um, we've had some issues in the past six months with getting checks on time. In some cases, taking uh, two weeks or more to get a check. So we're hoping that uh, as a number of the distributors utilize the ACH options, this will um, be something that will make their work as well as our work more efficient. Um, and just a little bit about the, uh, a little bit more about the application. Uh, initially, when uh, we started working with the distributors, we asked that they. Um, uh, just apply to us, register with us. It's a $200 initial registration fee. Again, if you were uh, um, re-upping for the second year and beyond, it's a $50 fee. Um, we, we have formalized that process a little bit more uh, by actually now issuing them, I think with the 2024 calendar year, issuing them a permit number. Um, helps them on their end, helps us a little bit better in keeping track of uh, who's where uh, in the process. Uh, and then requiring them to sign a, um, a wholesaler, wholesale dealer's document, which really um, outlines some of the key provisions that are in state law that are applicable to collection of cigarette taxes, as well as to provisions that are in the local ordinances um, of the jurisdictions. Uh, next slide, please. And then uh, also, um, you know, a, a part of the program, a um, big part of the program actually is um, working in compliance, and um, TJPC through its compliance agent actually um, is out there performing efforts on behalf of jurisdictions uh, in enforcing uh, the tax levy orders that have been ordinances that have been adopted. So um, first, though, with the distributors, we do have a process. Uh, we do expect them to report uh, to us on time, which in our case uh, is the tenth of each month, um, and to you know remit the tax that they have collected. Uh, there is a practice in place uh, for if those reports are not received on time, at which uh, they would get a warning. Um, second time, the next month, if they were late, it would be a 10% penalty, uh, and then a place of non probation if it happens again. With the retailers, uh, just to give you a sense of how many retailers um, are, are out there across those eight jurisdictions, uh, right now it's about 250 plus. Um, that our compliance agent over the first probably what 14 months or so that he was on board visited every single one of those. Uh, and uh, the goal initially was to inform them, to educate them, to make them aware that, hey, you've got this cigarette tax that your jurisdiction has adopted. This is what it means. This is what you need to do in order to comply with the ordinance. Um, some of them um, got to be uh, some of our friends because they got some additional visits. Um, in order to help them to be in compliance. And we're still working with a few who are very good friends now because we're still uh, trying to work to bring them in full compliance, which we uh, told them we expected by the end of the year 23. So we're at a point right now with compliance where 
Um, there is actually, in a very few out of the 250, there are um, old, what I'm going to call old, because they are they're more than two years old packs of cigarettes that were on shelves before the taxes took effect in July, in January of 2022. So the board had allowed those products to, to be sold through uh, without having to be accounted for you know, with the taxation. Um, but some of them are still sitting on the shelf. So I think we're actively working and hopefully maybe to the point of all of those being gone so that now we'll know if they're stamped there's there's cigarettes on shelves that are not stamped. We know that those have come into the retailer since the end of the cigarette tax. And as a result of that, we've now taken steps to put it in place. What happens in those cases where um, the stamps aren't present, there's the wrong stamps, and they're not coming into compliance, uh, at what point then we would, uh, would seize the cigarettes? And then there's an opportunity that's laid out in the ordinances uh, for the uh, retailers to actually go through the appeals process. Uh, but then you know, we've seized them, we have to store them, we have to keep them in a secure location. Uh, we have to provide them with certain notices in terms of what their rights are for the appeal. So it's a very intricate process. Um, and you know, hats off to, to our compliance agent because he's the one that's out there, you know, having to deal with folks uh, you know in the retail stores who sometimes you know, don't really know, you know, what it all means, you know, the cigarettes are stamped, uh, they need to be stamped to, to some that are just trying to spread around the ball and not be. But I think we're, we're, we're continuing to learn as we go. We've got, uh, again, Northern Virginia has been doing this for a long period of time. Uh, and there's two other um, regions uh, in the Commonwealth of Virginia that established regional boards at the same time that TJ PBC uh, the Blue Ridge Cigarette Tax Board was established. And both of those are actually um, uh, administered by the PDCs and those regions as well. So I think that may be the last slide. I know that's a lot of information, but you know, we try to come back to you all every six months to give you an update. You know, for some of you all, you're new to this, uh, so we're not going to this update before. I'm glad to take any questions. All right, questions? 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 I know the Louisa County doesn't participate in that. I have no idea why. Um, is it a situation where we could go through whatever process and join? There is. There is a process that the board can make a request, uh, board supervisors can make a request to the Regional Cigarette Tax Board to, to join. And, um, you know, if they agree to, to let you join, then there's certain things to do to align yourself up to be a member of that, but voting representation. Um, yeah, I think I'm glad to share that with you. I've heard whispers, you know, some about cigarette tax and stuff, but uh, you know, so thank you. For yeah, that. Sure. yeah, I think it was interesting. Yeah, we were having these discussions, um, you know, really starting in the spring, I guess, of 21. Um, but I think all the jurisdictions were of a light mind. We were, we're not going to rush through this and try to get it done in conjunction with the budget process at that time and, and bring it up and running in, in July. So that's why you saw in January 2020. Because there, you know, there's some things that the board has to do in terms of you know, passing uh, an agreement to join the board and then also to you know, go through the public hearing process you know, and their ordinance for letting the civil rights act deciding. You know, what's that going to be between you know, a penny and 40 cents? Really, right? Thanks. Thank you, David. All right, that takes us to number four, our consent agenda. There are three items. The first are the minutes of March 7, 2024. Are there any changes, edits, corrections, etc.? Those minutes. Is there a motion to approve those notes? So moved. I'll second. All right, motion's been made and seconded. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Extensions? Then we have the February financial reports. Christine, any comments? Very quick. We have 9.87 months of average operating expenses on hand, 1.81 in unrestricted assets. And February was another very strong financial month with a net gain um, in excess of $44,000. Any questions there? Is there a motion to accept the February financial reports? So moved. I'll say. All right, motion has been made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? All right. 
And then the fiscal year 25 rural, rural transportation work program and budget resolution. The resolution was in the packet. Christine, any comments there? No, there have been uh, no recommended or requested uh, changes or amendments since it was presented to you last month. So the draft that you received last month is the same would be the final version. And if there are no questions or comments there, uh, was, was there a motion to approve the resolution for the fiscal year 25 rural transportation plan work program? Okay, I'll move. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Yeah. All right, the motion has been made and seconded. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Does something just flash? I was looking down. Something just flash. Or I'm, or I'm having a. All right. Number five, new business, appointment of nominating committee for officers. So how this works, um, give a brief overview, especially for the new folks. So the fiscal year is when the change over of the chair, vice chair, and the treasurer happens. Also the secretary, so the, I'm the current chair, Mr. O'Brien is the current vice chair. Mr. Smith is the current treasurer. Christine serves as our secretary. So we'll have to have new leadership uh, and figure that out by uh, July. So typically we appoint the nominating committee in April. The nominating committee will come back and make a recommendation to the board um, in the May meeting and then uh, the board will decide and vote from there. So what we, uh, I think it's typically three people. Yeah. Yes, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Um, so we will need some volunteers to serve on the nominating committee. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have a problem, sir, for the last several years. All right. So we will go over. Thank you, sir. Any others willing to serve on the nominating committee? Mr. Goolsby. And then City person. I was going to speak to Mr. Payne, but not knowing he, I didn't I think he's going to be able to do it. But uh, <laughs> maybe I'll take the chair's priority and we'll appoint Paul Mr. Payne. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I got him. Yeah. Paul and Toll. Paul and Toll is one. So we will thanks for my opinion. Does that name official motion? I don't see it as an action item. We can, no. I can just appoint. Correct? Yes. All right, very good. Thank you. Uh, and again, those three will uh, get together and then they typically, so if you are interested in serving in uh, one of the positions, they will likely be speaking to you or you can reach out to them directly. And Jesse, like he's, he said, he's done this a handful of years, so yeah, he'll be reaching out. Awesome, thank you. And I'd like just to offer, if you need staff support in organizing a meeting, getting on calendars, we're happy to do that. Absolutely. I'll lean on you to send the email first to the next one. We need the, we, we just need a slate before the agenda is printed. That's right. You'll actually bring the slate back to yeah. present in the next meeting, and then it doesn't get voted on until the meeting after that. All right, that. so we got it. Just, yeah, send the email and do the data availability thing and do a Zoom or provide everybody here. Awesome. Tim, do you like meeting in person or over Zoom? In person. All right, we'll meet here. <laughs> Since Michael has at least distance to travel. <laughs> That'll be fun. Well, this would be great to do it. Yeah, I mean, you can't make it. That's all I know. Um, great, thank you. <laughs> Uh, item B under number five, appointment to the GO Virginia Region 9 Council, Christine. Okay, the um, Region 9 Council is comprised of Planning District 10 and Planning District 9. That's the TJPDC and the Rapid Hannock Rapid Ann Regional Planning Commission. Um, the GO Virginia Council is responsible for implementing the Commonwealth's GO Virginia Plan within that region. Um, they work to uh, review and award grants that incentivize collaboration between business, education, and local government. The TJPDC gets to um, have two different members serve as voting members on the Go Virginia 9 Council, one uh, CAO, a Chief Administrative Officer, and one elected official. Um, before reaching out to anybody, I did 
ask Go Virginia staff to give me a breakdown of everyone who served by every jurisdiction so that we can make sure that we are rotating that through across the many years. And it was identified that Green County, Albemarle County, and the city of Charlottesville have not had representation yet. Um, so in reaching out to folks, um, Kathy Shaprick, the county administrator, what's that? Does Nelson have representation? Nelson has. Steve was on. Steve initial. That's right. That's Steve. right. I brought it just in case you had that. But yes, yeah. Steve's initial. Steve. He just, yep. Yeah. Um, Kathy Shaprick, the Green County Administrator, um, is willing and excited to serve if you all are willing to appoint. And then Ned Galloway from Admiral County as the Board of Supervisor appointee. Um, so staff is just recommending a motion to appoint uh, the two of those respectively to the Go Virginia Region 9 Council as the PDC's CAO and elected official representatives respectively. They do serve two three-year terms and both of our current members' terms are expiring in June. Right, Mr. Chair, when you're ready for a motion, yeah, I was going to make the motion. What was the right hand? Yeah, I don't know, remember the first person's name. Kathy Shepard. Yeah, she's, she's the great Kathy. Kathy. All right, I'm going to put Kathy and Ned on the ghost of Jane. <laughs> I'll second. <laughs> All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Cool. All right, thank you. And then I can see the move safely Blue Ridge resolution of commitment to supporting roadway safety goals. This one can be fairly quick because our staff has already been around to all member uh, jurisdictions governing boards. But as you guys know, we were awarded a U.S. Department of Transportation grant to do a comprehensive safety action plan in all six jurisdictions. Um, one required component of the grant is that there is a leadership commitment to reduce serious crashes and fatalities on our roadways. Each member of government has already adopted their resolution specific to their goals in their jurisdiction. This is just one that says um, the TJPDC will also commit to supporting activities that can reduce um, serious crashes and uh, fatalities. So staff recommends motion to adopt a resolution of commitment to support roadway safety goals as adopted by its member jurisdictions governing boards. Chair, I move as presented. I will second. All right, motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion on this item? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? And that will take us to the fiscal year 25 draft operating budget. And Christine. Okay, this one up the presentation. Um, I'm going to begin with the budget timeline um, just to make sure to review that. In September, October of 2023, I brought up for you guys the projected FY25 budget that sets the per capita rates and that sets the amount that we then apply to our member jurisdictions for their local contributions through their budget process. Then in April, May of 2024, which is now, is the FY25 operating budget that we will use for management purposes. And then it actually comes back before you all in third version in February and March as an amended operating budget that closer aligns to the actuals that are going to be used for auditing purposes. The draft FY25 budget that's presented before you is a balanced budget with projected revenues and expenditures of just over $42.5 million. Next slide. We broke this down in a couple different ways. Um, so this is a slide that indicates the uh, revenues that we've received. I did it in two different ways. One of them is excluding the Virginia Telecommunications broadband because that dramatically skews our graph because the majority of those funds are passed through. And so in the top, you'll see all funding sources. And then in the bottom one, it'll show a more realistic representation of about 35% of our revenues are federal. 14.96 are from state sources. 46.35 are from local sources, and that does include the cigarette taxes as a local source. And then local per capita, that's just over 2.4% of our budget, and other sources such as rental income from extra states that we have. Okay. Next slide shows a breakdown of our federal revenues. Our federal revenues are $37.8 million. If you pull out the broadband, and then we pull that out, because otherwise this pie chart would be impossible to read. We pull out the body. We then have other federal <laughs> revenues that are non-body sources of just over $2.6 million. And you can see starting at 12 o'clock and working your way around um, what those federal sources are for the projects that we are um, running in the programming that we have. 
you can see the vast majority of our federal sources outside of body are actually home funds received from HUD. Christine, I don't know if it'd be advantageous. Some folks might not know what body is. Yes, great. I was just thinking about that. Yep. Body is the Virginia Telecommunication Initiative. That is the broadband grant that we received from the Department of Housing and Community Development um, to help facilitate universal broadband access across 13 year different jurisdictions, working with a private internet service provider as our partner. Next slide. The next one is a breakdown of our state revenue sources. Our state revenues are just over $1.1 million. The largest one is the Virginia Housing Grant, where we're actually developing uh, affordable housing units. Uh, the second largest being um, also related to housing in Burke. You'll see that the DHCD contribution, that's the top, that's our uh, state allocation from DHCD. It is in the draft budget that we would receive an increase of 25,000, but there wasn't enough confidence to put that in there yet. Once that's approved, I will add that into the budget. Um, but it could be that this year we do see an increase based on very strong efforts of the executive director of the Virginia Association of Planning District Commissions and its members. Are you still on that? How many years have you been the executive director? I was about to say, but it's a lot. <laughs> okay, next slide is the local revenues. Thank you, Ruth. Good job there. Um, what I did for this, let's see. What I did for this pie chart in order for it not to be skewed is I did pull out the local revenues received the blue red blue red cigarette taxes. So that 2.9 over 2.9 million is pulled out of this. Our non-cigarette tax local revenues. Um, are indicated here again with our largest ones coming from legislative liaison for the legislative services and also for the local matches for the safe streets and roads for all grant. And then finally is our per capita revenues. This is the member dues assessed at 66 per two cents uh, per capita. So next year's per capita revenue will be just over 178,000 and again broken out by uh, the six jurisdictions. Okay, but the budget expenditures. I think it's really important to note in our budget, while it's a $42.5 million budget, $40.5 million of that is pass through. It comes through our organization and it goes out um, to another source. So that's things such as the telecommunication initiative, the broadband. Um, we have large uh, pass throughs for the cigarette tax, as discussed, and then the federal um, home, home ARC, which is the, the HUD funding and housing preservation grants where we receive funding and then we work with sub-recipients who do the activities, um, as well as what's called the Virginia Eviction Reduction Pilot. That's another housing program trying to um, help reduce uh, evictions. All of these programs, we either work with sub-recipients or we work with consultants where we are not using that, those funds for ourselves, we're passing them through onto another organization or um, contracted agent. Our operating expenses then make up just over 2 million of the entire budget, and over 70% of that is related to personnel and branch. We anticipate having 14 full time staff next year and three part time staff. Then I'll run through a couple of other details that were um, in the budget memo um, that I put in your packets that goes into greater detail in each of these categories and talks about the funding splits for each of the different grant programs. Um, I do anticipate between this first draft that you're seeing and the draft that you see next month that there might be a couple of different changes. That's in hopes that we have a higher between now and then, so some of the salary fringe numbers may change. Um, I also have another staff member who is eligible for a promotion, so there's an increase in there. Um, and then we have, uh, well, yeah, please, that will be changes. I think those were the two main ones. The budget that is before you assumes a salary increase of an average percent of seven. The one that I'm already working on for you for next month is actually up to 7.8. And that's because in a lot of analysis that we did last year and bringing before you all and, and additional analysis we're doing this year is the PDC is lagging behind in all of our competitors and salary and compensation. And so we need to catch up and we know that's not realistic to do in one year. And so we have a three-year plan to be able to get there. Last year was to get everybody into the correct salary band. 
this year is to get people into the right place within that salary band. And then the third year will be as new employees come on, making sure that everybody is within a competitive place within our organization. Um, and so as you guys know, as we experience vacancies here, we do exit interviews. We do talk to folks about their compensation that they receive with their next employment. So we feel very strongly that we need to commit some resources to making sure that we catch the PDC up so we can continue to attract and retain very high quality staff to be working um, with your member jurisdictions. I'm happy to take any specific questions related to line items in the budget. Um, there's a lot of information in there, um, but again, this is in draft form and we'll come back to you with, with some revisions. Hopefully I'll also, that's the other revision. Hopefully I'll be adding the 25,000 for the, <coughs> Um, the HCD annual contribution. That would be the one. Questions? Comments? I will just back up the comments about the staffing. It's the TJPDC, the nature of the work means that they can get poached quite a bit, especially if they're lagging in the salary. All of the jurisdictions have done um, compensation studies and made adjustments. Um, so the TJPDC started that effort last year, as Christine said, to get them caught up. Um, don't want this to just be a place where somebody works and it gets poached as we were dealing with right now. We, had, we were fully staffed and then we went back to hunting for a couple of positions. Um, so it's important to do that. The, uh, a couple of the questions I would have just on the line items. Um, if you go to just this, is, I forget what page this was. Um, but if you look at the line items, for, there's a a new line item for contingency and the budget is for 89971. Did you speak to that so everybody's aware of what that's all about? Yes. That 89,000 is the annual contribution that we received from the Department of Housing Con uh, and Community Development. Um, in all years past that I can find in the analyzing budgets of the past 10 years, we have always budgeted that money towards administrative costs. There is a lot of argument for we shouldn't assume how that money is going to be spent because it is some of our most flexible funding that we have. There are very few requirements on that money. And so rather than budgeting it immediately to admin, if we can get our admin expenses covered through our indirect rate through our grantors, then I pull that into a contingency line item and we'd be able to use that to do things like match grants of local sources without having to go to our local governments. We could use that funding to pursue pipeline opportunities that staff can build that contingency line item. We can use that if there are areas where we want to slightly increase the amount of work that goes into a program. We can use that as a cost overrun category. So it really just pulls it out of a dedicated um, expense and puts it into a contingency line item that gives us the ability to use it flexibly like we have the ability to do, we just never have. Thank you. Then you have two that, if you look back to fiscal year 22, <clears throat> and even just to the previous year, fiscal year 24, you had some some jumps. One was audit and legal, and one was advertising. If you could speak to those. Yes. The audit and legal, um, I can speak to very easily. We have. Um, started using legal counsel, the more we engage in federal grant programs and the compliance and the reporting related to contracting, we are relying on our legal counsel to support us through that. Um, additionally, we are relying on legal counsel for things like uh, procurement, making sure that we're following all the procurement procedures. We are a small organization, we don't have a procurement office, so we use legal counsel for that. And then also a comprehensive contract review before we sign any contracts with outside agencies and also any matters that come up that are personnel related. I think an additional um, increase in cost is within our strategic plan, we agreed to look at all of our uh, personnel policies. So any changes that we'll be making to those, we'll want to put through legal review. Thank you. And then just to be fair, we did see the equipment data use. I didn't get it as up on this one. That? That's actually a decline. And you compare to 22, a jump in 23, drop in 24, mm -hmm. and it's come down a little bit more. I so might have to phone a friend, but I believe this one yeah, is, is changing how we classify some of our expenses. That traditionally we were putting them in data equipment use rather than putting them in a contractual expense. And so moving them from one category to the other, it looks like a decrease. It's actually just a reallocation. Do you want to add anything? Move to those lines. That is probably the majority of that. There may also be years where we are investing in equipment 
such as what has to do with that you know, the problem you know, before, and sometimes they don't have that Every year, I was thinking it was pandemic, like here, that job was a pandemic, and it's all the Zoom stuff. But you're right, having a new account on board or making sure everything's there are solutions working then the the so that will change the their own. It's not in the gap. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions on this this item? That's a very minor just the discussion of the, the legal and compliance costs, mainly curious if that is uh a ubiquitous practice in planning commissions, or if any planning commissions, rather than relying on private third party legal counsel, works with the constituent localities to do that compliance work? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Many of the planning district commissions that I have been talking to do have outside counsel and actually have utilized that counsel much more than our planning district has in the past. So we're seeing an increase in it because we're actually utilizing them in a way that many other planning district commissions have been consistently using them. But I don't know an answer to your question of how many are using legal from their member jurisdictions. That would strike me as odd, frankly. Yeah. Yeah, I would spread the cost on that. Yeah. Well, and how would you get the chief legal officer to, you know, turn away from their own locality? It's not like they're not busy enough. <laughs> like a fiscal agent, like a senator. For us, yeah. that would be, you know, that would be curious. Not worth the squeeze in those circumstances. <laughs> Great. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. That will bring us to, um, uh, and just so you're aware, Mr. Bryan and Mr. Pruitt, um, we did have to add a closed session this evening. So that's going to happen after the executive director's report. And it, if it puts us under a time constraint, but the ground table or something. Um, but that moves us to, to item six executive director evaluation process next steps. So, Christine and I, as I reviewed last month, we were going to <clears throat> identify an a, a evaluation instrument that has not been used in the past. We did that and pulled that down from. Uh, Oh, I forgot the letters. It, 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 I, yeah, yeah. It's a the city, county, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I see it. I see it. <laughs> the national city, county, so, Thank you. Kind of Thank you. so it's a it's a tool that has been developed for them as a national organization to use for city manager, county executive type of evaluations. We uh, um Christine Christine. And I work to edit that to be a little bit more specific for the TJPDC purposes. That has all been completed. Christine has used the same instrument you all will use to evaluate her to complete a self evaluation. So that's, she's already submitted that in. So um, tomorrow I will be sending out to each commissioner the PDF file for the instrument. It is one that you simply open and you type in your name and your location, and then you put in your rank score. It, I think, if I remember, it defaults to NA. So for some new members, we had a conversation about if you feel like you're not, you don't feel like you have enough information to be able to score it, you can just leave it blank and it'll come back as an A. It's a one, two, three scale. Uh, uh, meets expectations, exceeds expectations, or is below expectations. I think they're going to, they're going to be like 10, 10 or 12 type of items. Um, I will send that out with Christine's self evaluation so you will be able to see what she is or how she ranked herself, and uh, so that you can use that to do your own completion of the instrument. Then I'll have you email those back to me directly. I'm hoping that you will all have them back by. 425. That will give me one week to compile the scores anonymously, put it all together in one so that you will have by the next TJPDC meeting where we do our actual in person evaluation. And it will give Christine time to be able to review what everybody has said about it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and again, anonymously, if you want to identify or self identify, that's your call, but it'll be in the report. So, for example, item one, there's you know all the commissioners will put, I'll just put all the scores you receive from each person without names attached to it, give her an average score, and then we'll have that to use to discuss when we meet with Christine in closed session. 
Um, if you can get it back and done by sooner the better, because the compilation will take a little bit of time, but the 25th gives me a week to chase down any stragglers who don't complete the tool. Uh, and then um, let's go to just get that into the hands of the commissioners before the next commission. Any questions on that process? I appreciate Christine going through the instrument and, and working on it to help uh, edit it to be a, be a good good thing to use and kind of formalize this evaluation of that just forward for the for the positions. Anything you want to add? Or? Um I would just like to add that we um I also ask all staff to evaluate me using a little bit of a different instrument that gets more down into line item management type things. Um, if you all are interested in the results of that, I'm happy to bring that to the closed session to, to share with you the results that I got from the staff. Great. Questions, comments? Good. All right. So that will take us to uh, number seven, the executive director's report. Um, the first one I want to give is that is an administrative update. As you guys know, we have three uh, transportation planner vacancies that has causes quite a bit of strain on a very small organization to fill those gaps because we still have federal requirements that we have to meet. Um, so we've had an exceptional amount of staff taking on duties that are not their normal assigned duties. Um, within the approved budget from FY24, um, I intend to compensate any staff members who have taken on additional duties with a temporary bump and in, in increase in pay to compensate them for that additional work that they're, they're doing. It doesn't require any more funding than is already improved, but I want to make sure folks are, are getting paid for the additional work that they're doing on top of their additional duties. Um, comprehensive economic development strategy, we did uh, receive the draft of that. Um, we have a 30-day uh, statutory re review period. So that is out on our website. Um, it has been pushed out um, through multiple sources. Um, we do encourage you guys to go look at that report. There's a lot of really great data in that report. Um, it will then come back before you all in May for a presentation and then for consideration for approval and adoption. That grant does expire in mid-June, so it does require an adoption in the main meeting in, in order to meet our timeline for the grant. And then the final update, I'm not going to read to you because each month we give you the um, broadband um, numbers to date. So that's within the executive director report. If you have any questions on that, please reach out to us. That's all I have. Any questions or comments for the executive report? All right. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. All right, board will go into closed meeting at this time. I'm going to just read I'll read the motion, um, if that's all right. Uh, I, Nick Galloway, move that the commission be convened to a closed session pursuant to the exemption found in section 2.2, 3711A7 of the Code of Virginia for consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such consultation or briefing an open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body and pursuant to the exemption found in section 2.2311A8 of the Code of Virginia for consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. Is there a second? I'll second. And then I'm going to do the roll call here because there's a error on the sheet that you have to name. Um, as soon as I remember how to spell Phillips last name. Oh, wait, yeah, that's the one yeah. Um, so yeah, there we go. There's a fashion there. Uh, Mr. Payne is absent. Mr. Garantia? All right. Uh, Mr. Galloway, aye. Mr. Pruitt. Aye. Mr. O'Brien. Aye. Mr. Goolsby. Aye. Mr. Higgins. Aye. Mr. Woodward. Aye. Mr. Reed. Aye. Mr. Rutherford. Yes. All right. Thank you. So we are in closed meeting. We are going to ask the uh, Christine, who is staying with us here? It will be um, Laura Green as uh, HR director and myself. Thank you, Ruth. I need Galloway move with the commission to exit closed session. 
Second. Motion is seconded by Jesse Rutherford. Um, and I'll do roll call. Mr. Payne is absent. Mr. Grandia? Aye. Mr. Galloway? Aye. Mr. Pruitt? Aye. Mr. O'Brien? Aye. Mr. Smith is absent. Mr. Woodward? Aye. Mr. Goolsby? Aye. Mr. Higgins? Aye. Mr. Barlow is absent. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Rutherford? Yes. yes. Thank you. And I, Ned Galloway, move that the commission certify that to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matter is lawfully exempted from the open meeting requirements of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act and identified in the motion authorizing the closed session were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed session. Is there a second? There is. I got Jesse for the second. Is it Freedom of Information Act or the actual uh, section? <laughs> Uh, I know we usually quote that to go in. I don't recall. Mark, can you advise the question is, is that the appropriate language in the motion to certify saying uh, for the requirements of the Freedom of Information Act? Well, of course, it's, you know, it is a motion that while in closed session, you only discuss matters that you went in for and the matters that you went in for were are legal and authorized under the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. That's your certification. So again, the motion was made by myself, seconded by Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Payne is absent. Mr. Granzio? All right. Uh, Mr. Galloway, aye. Mr. Pruitt? Aye. Mr. O'Brien? Aye. Mr. Smith is absent. Mr. Woodward? Aye. Mr. Goolsby? Aye. Mr. Higgins? Aye. Mr. Barlow is absent. Mr. Reed? Aye. And Mr. Rutherford. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'll see you all there. Thank you. Mr. Great. Clark. Thank you. All right. On the agenda, that puts us to number eight other business. We do have time. Thank you for moving through that quickly. Uh, but that brings us to the roundtable discussion by jurisdiction. And I just I'll start at the, the end down here. Mr. Goolsby, why? Update us on anything from Green County. Uh, we're going through the physical budget, and I think we're even set to make the full vote by April 23rd. Uh, process for sure. <laughs> some people are happy, some people are not. <laughs> did, uh, Green County did receive like a $3 million. Grant thing to Bryce Reeves and that committee for to help pay some for this new water project sourced in green for the other COVID you know, between the, the reservoir and then all the water line updates and new pump stations and all that. So all that's slowly starting to take shape and get finalized and they advertise for what dropped some of the property and, and, and real estate tax for the room and advertise. It's not fully voted on, but it's been advertised. So a lot of people in Green County are very happy about that. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's this that's whole thing. Once we get through this budget, then it all, which I think pretty much every county does that every year, the same thing. So, other than that, it's, it's going along pretty good there. So. <laughs> Got some new developments coming in and quite a few new housing developments coming in that was already been approved back from years ago and stuff. So coming online. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, other than that, that's, that's where we are right now at Green County. So. Very good. Mr. Higgins, anything to add? I really have nothing to add to right. We'll go to Mr. Pruitt, Alamar. Sure. We are also in the in the latter days of our budget process, we had advertised our tax rate. Um, we started with a balanced budget. Um, we identified a few primarily uh, health and safety related issues. Fire and, um, fire and police were some of the concerns. And additionally, uh, expansion of the sheriff's office to support with you know, busing people hither and yon for, for temporary detention orders. 
um, those all uh, added a few mil to the budget. Uh, and so with that, there is an increase in the personal property tax that's been advertised, as well as a 1% match to um, Charlottesville's uh, transient occupancy tax. Uh, we had staff, we worked with staff to kind of measure the specific amount that we were advertising for the increase in um, personal property to be um, basically the effective rate of before the, the decrease, which is something on the order of like a 60% return to where we had been. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, just uh, over the past few days, really past yesterday, we had um, quite a few land use related discussions that we continue to work through our comprehensive plan. Um, there was a kind of a, an agreement to one day further discuss at some point the, the development area and the overall um, and actually retain uh, language to consider like, to consider creating pathways for formal consideration of what expansion might look like, what not sure and how that might proceed uh, in there. Um, <clears throat> additionally, uh, just something that I'm that I know is happening on the background, but it's not um, really on the floor right now, but it might be interesting to this committee. You know, uh, both Supervisor Gallo and myself have talked about how we recently significantly changed our affordable dwelling unit uh, program to have uh, pretty high standards, both for the uh, number of units that are set aside and the um, and the level of affordability that's required, so 20 and 60. Um, those are really ambitious. And also, um, there is a growing demand in our community, especially in certain sectors of our community, to, um, to expand the, the number of subsidies that are available for, um, for development through a uh, through significant increase and restructuring how our, our fund is done. My understanding is the next big step uh, in getting there is going to be examining how we actually structure fees in lieu. Um, which goes hand in hand with that first policy, which is why I mentioned it. This is the ability of the developer to kind of buy out of their requirements. Um, I don't know that our current policies on that are very formalized or commonly used. Well, I know they're not commonly used, and I don't believe they're very formalized. Um, so getting that formalized where it actually is kind of sitting right there on a balanced fulcrum where there is an equal chance that someone might utilize uh, a payment in lieu versus actually delivering affordable the units themselves. Mm -hmm is going to be a huge uh, effort that I know our housing office is undertaking. It's going to be very interesting as that comes online, um, see how that really uh, divvies out. Some localities have been a loose scheme that ends up being the only option people use. And it's therefore ultimately how they get all their points. Basically developers never want to do it themselves. So it all goes to paying. So it all gets built by nonprofit developers and others uh, have a lower set of standards or a, crappy payment loose system. So everything is built by uh, private developers. I think the ideal is somewhere in between. Um, and we'll see how well we can have this. The only thing I would add is our county executive, as you know, we had several fires, dozens of fires, and other counties were dealing with that. Uh, we happened to be in session when that issue was happening. So we were able to declare a local emergency right then and there, the county executive needed it. But last night he gave us the report that our our prior personnel and uh, emergency services were maxed out that day. Um, the uh, the having the declared the local emergency allowed us to pull in resources from outside, so other localities were able to come in that day and assist um, the board to get a full report on just what that meant maxed out to, to understand it further, um, which speaks to one of the items that we're adding in to our budget and uh, looking for additional revenue for which is supporting volunteer in our North Star Fire Department, but then also adding a full, another full staff ambulance at our Seminole Trail, which is right off 29 at Berkmar, which is our busiest station. Um, but uh, other counties I know were dealing with the same issue that day. I know Madison especially was one that was, was hit. Um, but it's interesting, you know, we, I was making a comment in a sidebar last night with another supervisor that we talk about emergency events as if they're these big significant deals like, oh, a hurricane or a big tornado or an earthquake. But here we had a downed wire, electric wire that started a massive fire 
I'm sure some of the others were created for other reasons, just because of the rotations of where they were at. And that maxed out our capacity. It wasn't a hurricane. It wasn't a tornado. It wasn't an airplane crash. So the point in, that I was trying to make with the, you know, sharing last night in my mind is that it's not these big emergency events that could necessarily max out your emergency personnel. It could be as simple as somebody hooking a cigarette out of the window at the right time. And the next thing you know, your, your personnel and your surrounding counties personnel, if you now had a tractor trailer wreck on I-64 and they're all out battling fires, do you have the capacity to make a good deal with that situation? Um, and that's disconcerting in my view. So um, I'll be curious to see the county executive's report on that and what that meant and then what that means for our budget and trying to get the personnel personnel there. Um, thank you. Mr. Woodward, Louisa Canis. Well, we're trying to get our budget wrapped up as well. Included in that budget is what you may have just talked about um, with fire and EMS. And, you know, uh, the biggest problem we have is probably the same as most everybody has is getting the people to come and do the job. I mean, it's just, I don't care what kind of service you're involved with, man. It, it's just hard to get people and much less qualified. I mean, you know, obviously everybody's seeking the, really the best, but um, so anyway, we've got, uh, I think it's six new full-time positions that we're funding and uh, I um, don't remember right off the top of head, maybe eight part time positions, something like that. Um, but uh, whether we'll be able to find those people, I don't know. And we're finding out that uh, fire and EMS is fast becoming probably, if you take the school systems out, system out, it's going to become pretty quickly probably our largest uh, budget leader as far as the Canada Department is concerned. But I uh, can't. Once you, once you decide to go to paid in the rural area, you can't turn and go, no, <laughs> you made that commitment and you better be willing to go into it for. So those are the types of things. We also had an emergency situation in Louisa, same day, about 200 acres burned, burned uh, building at Twin Oaks, the economy that's been there since back in the 60s. I think it's the most successful economy in the, in the country, at least at one time. Um, they lost a pretty good sized building over there. And um, thank goodness we didn't lose any dwellings. But there was down in actually where Mr. Barlow lives down in the eastern, southeastern part of the county, lady that is a retired clerk of the Juvenile Domestic Relations Court lost her house, not because of any, <laughs> not sure what happened, but you know, it was it wasn't related to the motion or anything like that. Um, nobody was interested in this, but she lost everything she had. So anyway, but that really taxed. You know, they were already at that fire fighting it, and so just fortunately, we, I mean, we've got really great neighbors in the counties, and they were they came in and at least I think three or four other counties, Blue Anne, Guthrie, and they can't over somebody said some stuff like too. So. Anyway, but we did declare a state of emergency because of that and set up shelter. I think we had about eight families, six or eight families that went to the shelter for the day. Later on that night, they didn't have to spend the night at the shelter. So, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. City, Mr. Durante. So, just for a change of pace, I thought I'd just discuss the uh, conclusion of our budget season. <laughs> <laughs> so, the Final work session has uh, either for the city has either just ended or everyone in that room is really hoping it's going to end in a second. <laughs> uh, uh, and most of the, and uh, I will admit, I have not been as focused on that as I have been last past years just because of uh, professionally I've been going wide open, shows what been wide open for the last three weeks, so I moved back to uh, But um, most of and most of the dangling issues, of course, the deficit that school needs and decisions about changes to the taxes, et cetera. Most of that's going to be established, I think, by consensus tonight. So I can't report on that. Um, as far as uh, other matters in the city, um, which I'm paying attention to, that's on the housing side. 
I can talk to you about our uh, our brand new feeding food system. Uh, do I know if it works? No, uh, but <laughs> probably won't for five years. <laughs> but uh, we have been, uh, uh, but we have on our larger projects. Uh, uh, sometimes those those um, fees in lieu have been discussed at the at the dais and are sort of customized at the moment, <laughs> um, which uh, which I'm sure it, which is. Probably an absolutely horrible way to manage that, but it ends up being done that way anyway. Um, we are, you know, uh, we are moving forward with our land bank uh, process, and reason that's out, and the uh, subcommittee of the House of the Housing Advisory Committee is handling that. Um, I have a question here, actually, for uh, Commission staff. Anybody know how much actual home money we're getting? How much actual home money the city is getting, or yeah, the home period. portion? Yeah, period, because we've been waiting on the famous email to, to, to actually finalize. I've not heard anything about the email. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the uh, CBBG task force is postponed to get another meeting, yeah. uh, awaiting <laughs> final numbers so we can make allocations. Um, and I'm sure there's a rash of other things, but again, I'm going to go with the chair of Thank you. Mr. O'Brien, go back. We're finishing up our budget season. It's actually been a relatively smooth budget season, um, which is unusual. Uh, and nice for the two new supervisors. Um, look, uh, we'll, we'll actually be flat in terms of our um, assessment. Um, so our you know, tax rate is going to remain flat. We have good funding in our CIP budget. Uh, schools request was fully funded, so see so far it hasn't been good, but we seem to be down to the last $180,000 of, of how we're going to spend it, and that will probably go towards the sheriff's department to try to you know, increase pay there. Um, despite having done a salary study and having done the pay increases, it's uh, kind of a revolving door. We did that just two or three years ago, two and a half years ago. And uh, we were you know, I think in the middle of the pack, and now we're in the bottom of the pack. And there being no recruiting for uh, first responders is very challenging. And that uh, seems to be a, a door that um, we, we can't, we, we can't, we can't keep close. You know, it's always open in the sense that you're always trying to find somebody to come in, you're always losing somebody. Uh, so that, that's kind of what we are as far as the budget goes. Uh, in a sense, there's a little bit of tax relief for the citizens because uh, 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 property, personal property values come down for the floor. So we're going to save some money on that side. So, uh, we passed an ordinance uh, uh, formalizing uh, uh, short term rentals. Um, my opinion, a little bit too restrictive. We're going to be able to do this for uh, 10 acres. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, Small, I think, when you talk about what they could do, and I think we're limiting it to three bedrooms. And only two people per bedroom, two adults per bedroom. Well, that would be pretty interesting. How do you do that? You know, that's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked that question. I asked that of my fellow people that seemed to be that we were looking for the problem that doesn't even exist right now. And the concern was, um, you know, you have these free calls that Louisa County gets down with late there. We have Point down to show up at midway pass. It's just there's that all in there. But we, we don't have that problem down there. Coming up with why the country. Uh, I once got into the argument with uh, the health department. They were arguing about people in the house, and they said, you know, this, the, the health department quantifies two people per bedroom because it's based off of water and sewer usage. I said, okay, do you manage that on all residents in the whole community? Or is it just people who rent homes? So, because this family has a family of eight with two parents. Oh, we have grandparents with it too, right. on a two bedroom set. I said, now I'm not going to live there. So it shouldn't be if I got it right. I said, but you know, you're going to force that on me. I'm a, right. Oh, you're not. <laughs> so, um, so that, that's the that's thing. We're uh, moving forward with the committee uh, to evaluate our ordinances for solar. Uh, industrial scale solar and smaller scale solar, things like setbacks. Um, you know, spaces between those. We have a fire at one of the 
solar funds recently. There was a little bit of concern about uh, first responders being able to respond adequately and understanding where the wiring was. And, um, you can't really turn anything off slide all the time. So it, it, this is a little bit of a training issue there when you're dealing with this. Thing. But we're also considering moving uh, this last meeting uh, uh, the department for industrial sales, scale solar to be in uh, I one zoning only, which would essentially mean that we yeah, yeah, not doing it because you'd be doing spot zoning in many cases, and you really wouldn't want to have industrial solar in your own zones. In your I one zones, and yeah. So um, uh, that's an uh, interesting approach. Though we'll see how that comes out as being the planning commission um, again with this committee of. Two planning commission members, two board members, um, to come up with some solutions and ideas for both of those programs. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, other than that, uh, pretty fine. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Mr. Reed, now sit down. Um, briefly, this Jesse will follow me. Um, uh, next, oh, week, uh, <laughs> next, next week, we have. Uh, Comprehensive plan uh, approval considered at our board supervisor meeting. Two days later, um, we will have our public hearing on the tax rate. We've advertised a pretty sign real estate tax. Mm -hmm. You did increase your real estate tax. Yeah. Well, we, 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 to. we <laughs> advertised a oh, penny increase. Penny. I see you don't have the consensus. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm questioning my logic of ending with Mr. Rutherford. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like a six hour later. Well, anyways, don't worry. I'm, I'm amassing the population of Nelson County. We've gotten the finest pillows and feathers, and we're going to use them in the event, and I'll be part of the feather to all to see. If you want to see the spectacle on April the 11th. <laughs> Um, anyways, we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll get that tax increase in the blood, fingers crossed. Um, but we haven't done that. We haven't had a tax rate increase, I think, in like 20 years, <laughs> something like that. But, but we'll find out. Comp plan, yes, it's already said we gotta get that done. We're excited. I'm, you feel pretty confident. I can't. All right, I still have no, I don't know why we even just done. We're on month like 25. And I don't want to. I mean, Charles, now you're, 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 you're not. No, I'm just saying, we're not Charlottesville, but I, I think I'm comp planned out. I'm ready to do zoning and get that done. Ernie, I'm sure, is the same. Um, that's going to be a big deal. We're going to see that. I had a bachelor's degree worth of time going into that. I don't really have much to know that. I you know, just add it. I did this every year during the budget season. Uh, what it always asks the county administrator to present the inflation adjusted tax rate, mm -hmm. which is always very interesting now. Yeah. You, know, you, got, you, you know, some counties, of course, don't equalize, they just kind of keep the rate flat, you know, to absorb through the equalization. But were we to adjust our tax rate for uh, inflation going back to 1974, then the tax rate would be somewhere in the two dollar range. <laughs> so I mean, you know, but it's a fair point to say, you know, back in 1974, you were actually paying two dollars tax rate versus what you're paying. If only we were the difference was the size of the you know, price of the house. Uh, who here this this year is the state officially pulling money away from another pulling money away from Gotham schools? Um, I know Nelson. Yeah, bad. Green, they've given y'all more money or less money? I don't think they've given any more, but I don't think they've taken anything either. I think it's kind of. But you lucked out. Yeah, they pulled about $2 million from us, $8 million from them. Yeah, I think I think Green's y'all are pretty fun. much they flat on what they're doing. Did they give y'all more? We got a pretty good there. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, we're paying us up. We actually had a few more people. We had one of the private schools close. So, oh, okay. I mean, we actually got a rainfall in this thing this year. Because there's so many um, guttings that I'm like, surely somewhere, some district must have got yeah, There's a winner somewhere. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And be because I've got two minutes, yes. um, I wanted to let Tony know that. Uh, 
uh, the board passed a resolution yeah. that closed the off the Virginia Administrative Code. Oh, great. great. Appreciate that. So, I'm going to say, what's the year to have me? A year to one. Well, yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, an arrangement passed on, you know, they, I think, the meeting April 30th. And, uh, and so there's been some legal back and forth between you know what they're requesting of us and what we're requesting of them. Uh, and you know, hopefully the SEC will recognize that what's being asked by us was uh yeah, really out of line with uh you know pretty much everywhere else, and it is outrageous. Uh, so uh I, I hope I hope that, that it ends up uh, not going up at all, and, and I hope that Aqua learns a lesson. And, Recognizes that they have a lot of a lot of work to do to stay competitive and create the best opportunity because they don't have it. Mm -hmm. And we can add an update to answer your question. She was just in contact with our HUD representative. Yeah. Um, yeah so um, since the federal budget was passed so late, um, HUD is still waiting to hear from Congress how much money has been allocated to HUD, and at that point they'll be able to. Um, make allocations to um, so the state. Anyway, uh, since I, I, the extremely selfish reason that I chair the CDBG task force, um, and so, uh, any sense of the timing on that? No, not at this time. <laughs> I can optimistically say I've penciled it in for your May meeting to look at the plan, but that doesn't mean we'll know anything by then. But we have to we have to begin drafting all of our stuff. Yeah, well, we don't uh, know. We're, we, we're the planning commission is supposed to sign off on this thing. Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. saying, you know, all right. All right. Uh, just a reminder you'll be seeing the executive director evaluation uh, item coming out in your email tomorrow and have that back by 4 25 for me, please. I'll put all those instructions and reminders in there. And then um, for, for uh, Mr. O'Brien and Mr. Pruitt, we did appoint Mr. Rutherford, Mr. Goolsby, and Mr. Payne to the nominating committee. For the leadership positions uh, coming up, and then we'll have the SEDS plan, and we will be doing a closed session to do the executive director evaluation at the next meeting as well. All right, thank you everyone for a good meeting. And it's a good job. Second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All right, everybody have a good evening. Yes. 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 Yes.